Let us look at the Word of God today. Today's Word of God is from Romans chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. Romans 6, 14 to 15. Let us read it all together. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Amen. And now our senior pastor will come up and preach with the title, A Distorted Soteriology, Widespread in Protestantism that Paul Denied and Even Paul's Adversaries Ridiculed. The person presiding today seems like he's older than me. I'm actually older than him but he's uh, surpassing the generations. And so today the hymn that we sang, uh, we sang hymn 586. And originally I didn't want to sing this song because we've sang it a lot and it's a little boring now. But the reason why we sang this song is because if you look in the lyrics in verse 2, It says, how beautiful and good it is to stand on the side of truth. Even when we are shackled on top of this truth, it is beneficial to us. The cowardly turn away, but the brave stand firm. And I lived out this life. And this is my life. And not only me, but you all lived out this life. So many people were cowardly and turned away, even though they knew that this was the truth, this was right, that they knew we were not problematic and that we were more biblical than other churches, that we were shockingly biblical. Even though they knew this, uh, they were cowardly and they turned away. But if you also look in verse four, it says, if you follow the truth, you will uh, face hardships. And I have faced these hardships for over 20 years now. And our members have, you know, some people have not experienced it severely, but many people have. And the reason why I'm talking about this suddenly is when I went to the retreat center, I was talking to our associate pastors and we were talking about our young adults and uh, how difficult it is for our young adults to marry. Same for um, getting a job, but also getting married. And it's hard for us to uh, get new pastors. Other people in their denominations, they have these pastors ready that they can recruit, but we have to find our recruit pastors from inside our members. So it's incredibly hard to do, and it's incredibly hard to find good pastors. And so when whenever we have to change uh, pastors from our different satellite churches, I uh, am in great stress. And, you know, it's the same when people try to marry, um, when they're trying to marry, they try to marry other Christians. And it's not limited to just one church. You can find it in other churches. But because the Korean church has slandered us and the cowardly pastors have turned away and, uh, and closed their lips because of this fact, for our members, they can only find people inside our church. So there are so many people who are not, uh, unable to marry and and they have to lower their standards to marry or they are unable to marry. There's so many young adults like that. And, you know, if, if they try to um, sign up to a Christian site, they won't accept our church members on that site. So there's it's it's really truly um corrupt and awful that the korean churches are doing this to us and you know when i heard this and thought about this my heart truly broke when i think about our young adults my heart breaks for them and you know like if some kindergartners are not able to go into kindergarten a good christian kindergarten because of this and you can't get into good christian schools you can't get into good jobs because of attending our church and it's the same for marriage it's not easy to get married when you're attending our church so when i think of this my heart hurts my heart breaks and so last week while I was praying to God, I prayed with this topic in mind. There's no way through man but God 
you know, creates water in the desert time, creates manna and quail. And God is almighty. So God must work and open the doors to marriage in our young adult uh, groups, because we have been slandered so much unfairly by the Korean church. How much longer must we do this? So Father God, you love our young adults. So will you open the paths? Will you allow them to meet good partners? And the reason that I am uh, talking about this is to ask you all to pray for this as well. Every single day when you pray to remember our young adults and pray for them, starting from our Sunday schoolers to our young adults, to pray for them so that they can go into good schools, marry well, and have good jobs if you can pray for this. And when I think about these things and I change my perspective and put myself in their shoes, I think I really want to say, go to a different church. I really wish I could say that. But first off, because of the truth, I can't say that. Because this truth, where can they hear it? Right? But then, oh, I thought, okay, uh, it's on the internet. I upload it on the internet. But because of Africa, then I can't send these people because our members need to support us and be here. That's how we can uh, take up the missions in Africa. You know, we're able to save so many souls through these missions. I don't think there's a church in Korea that will save as many souls as we will in church history uh, through these missions. And we're going to be able to save so many souls, countless souls. And so, you know, we are pouring out our finances uh, to Africa because of this. And, you know, you all need to um, stay put in your spots and help out uh, for this missions. And, you know, we all have our personal issues and uh, experiences, but there's also issues that God is uh, focusing on. So, My heart breaks, but is also desperate to keep you here. So when we pray, let's pray for this desperately for our young adults, for our children to continue to pray. And then next, uh, as I uploaded on our website, on our blog, God gave me amazing revelations, uh, biblical revelations, and they're continuing to pour out. And now I I figured things out about chapter seven as well, why it's written in the present tense. It's one of the most difficult uh, issues, but now I'm able to understand it as well. And I'm suddenly able to understand it fully. And so today, uh, what I would like to share with you all uh, is something that I uh, received as a revelation on Tuesday. And so I recorded it, and I organized it, and I was going on my way to the retreat center, and I started to worry about getting in a car accident. Sometimes I, I get worried over these things. When God pours out to me these revelations, I worry, I can't die just knowing this by myself. This must be preached. I need to record it and also um, publish it as a book so that the next generation has this. And so when God gives me these revelations, I start getting scared because I am a, a pastor who has preached for decades and researched for decades. So I know that this is a historical new interpretation uh, since the Bible has been recorded when I received these revelations. I know this, so I know how precious it is and that this is supernatural. And so I know that I cannot die uh, just knowing this by myself. And so when I realize these things, I get scared of dying, not because I'm scared of dying, but because I'm scared of not being able to preach this truth. So that's why I tell my associate pastors, be careful of driving. Be careful of driving, especially today. And sometimes I wonder, maybe I shouldn't even go to the retreat center. I should maybe just stay at my church office because that's how precious these truths feel to me. And so God gives grace to those who realize what is precious. 
you know, we started from Christians going to hell uh, all the way till now. And, you know, even though God is pouring out better revelations and deeper revelations, these elders and pastors and deacons and Christians, if they don't know the worth of this truth, right? Don't give the pearl to the pigs. That's the message that God first gave me when he was giving me these truths, right? Don't throw these uh, these pearls to uh, the pigs and give the holy things to the dogs because dogs are not interested in the holy things. Pigs are only interested in eating food and, and, and mud. They're not interested in pearls. So what's shocking is that there are so many pastors who are not interested in the truth. You know, I don't understand why they became pastors. There are so many pastors who are not interested in the truth, who are just satisfied with doctrine. And even if you show them that truth, they're not interested. They're not focused on it. There are so many pastors like this. Same for elders and deacons and believers. There are so many people who are not interested in the truth. They just want to come out to church and listen to the sermon and they're satisfied with the doctrine. They're not interested in what the real gospel that the Bible is talking about is, what that truth is, that this is vitally important, that this will determine our life and death and our future. So many people are not interested in this about what the truth is, what the real gospel is. And because they're not interested in this, when they listen to sermons, they just think it's difficult. They think it's just long. They just think, why is he talking about other things? And they don't understand and they don't receive blessings from it. They're not, uh, it's not grace filled for them. And they're cursed in this manner. Faith comes from listening, and listening is from listening to this word. We are saved from this faith, and we receive faith through listening. But if you don't, you're not interested, and you're not listening, then how can that person's soul change? Like, they're just going to attend church and then go to hell and be a nominal Christian. And so to love the truth is incredibly important. If you look in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, it says, With all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So it says God wants them to be to perish. God de de desires them to be deluded you know, from whatever things, so that they will, be, uh, they, that they will perish. And God is not interested in the people who are not interested in the truth. Are they just animals? How are you not interested in this truth? If you are created in God's image, then you should be interested in this truth, right? In this eternal life, in interested in salvation. You know, you're not a, an animal. How can humankind not be interested in this truth? God does not delight in these people. God doesn't like them. And so we must be interested in the truth. The reason our church is so beautiful is not because someone is so amazing, but it's because people who desire the truth have gathered here together. The pastors who are interested in the truth, members who are interested in the truth are here. That's why they realize the truth and accept the truth and are made new with the truth, born again and transformed. Isn't this true? And so the spirit through the truth is doing all these things. And so I'm, I'm worried that I might be in a car accident. That's how precious this word is. And so some people might not know that because they're not interested. They're not even curious about it. So they don't even know that this is a difficult passage. They don't know that this is a problem that has not been solved for thousands of years since the Bible has been created. So there's no awe in how special this is. You know, they don't understand why I post these blogs about uh, these revelations. And so when I am talking about the Roman series sermon, uh, I said there are two highlights in these this sermon series that Romans uh, not only Romans 2 2 to 5 is it about repentance but the entire chapter of 2 is about repentance so Romans is not just talking about faith but it's talking about repentance and faith so it's not faith alone 
Like Jesus spoke, it's faith, repentance, and faith. Faith alone is a slogan that should be, uh, should be rejected from the Christian sphere. And the second highlight was a more difficult one, but it's uh, chapter 8, 29 to 30, about being glorified, that he was glorif- he glorified, and that this is in the future tense. People thought that, uh, you know, Calvinists thought that because it's in the future tense, uh, they're saying your ultimate salvation is so assured. That's why it's written in the future tense. So once saved is always saved. But I proved to you all for the first time through the context of the Bible that this is not true. For the first time in Christian history, I proved to you the, the opposite. Completely and perfectly, I explained it to you all. That was the second highlight. But now there's a new highlight. And it's what we're talking about today. Romans 14 and 15, that this is a very, very difficult passage. The fact that you were not uh, having a difficult time with this is what surprises me more. Because for over 20, 30 years, this is something I struggled with. No matter how many commentaries I read, it didn't make sense. But last week, I was able to perfectly understand this and receive it from God. And so this is the third highlight of the Roman Sermon Series. And so today, this message that I will be preaching to you is an incredibly important message. So I hope you can, uh, you know, be energized as you listen today. So today's main passage is Romans 6, 14 to 15. And today's message Uh, title is the following, a distorted soteriology widespread in Protestantism that Paul denied and even Paul's adversaries ridiculed. It's exactly this, that Paul denied and even Paul's adversaries ridiculed this distorted soteriology widespread in Protestantism. I would say around 80 to 90% of Protestant, uh, the Protestant church has this distorted soteriology widespread inside of it. So it's not a simple matter. So I want to start the sermon today. So in our Roman sermon series, I discussed how Romans should be divided into chapters three to five and chapters six to eight, and that the former is uh, explaining justification against legalism. That's why they emphasized faith and grace, and that the latter uh, was speaking about justification against antinomianism. And so it emphasized the need for obedience and the warning against being forsaken. And I spoke that you need to combine the two for it to be the true gospel of Paul. It's not the kind of gospel that Calvin or Luther talked about, but it's that not only do you need to be called righteous through faith and grace, but you also need to obey and you also can be forsaken. So you need to stay awake and have a good faith life. This is Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel is not the gospel that is spread throughout the Christian uh, Korean churches. But this division of three to five and six to eight is in juxtaposition and uh, does n- in contradiction with Romans 5, 12, uh, 5, 17, 19, and 20 to 21, because all of those verses seem to include obedience in chapter 5 as well. But I explained last week that this was a wrong interpretation, that these verses in chapter 5 actually do not include obedience. However, Because my interpretation is a new interpretation, it's different from the interpretations that uh, the scholars and commentators have done. And because this is a new interpretation, I have a bigger burden. If I was speaking about uh, an interpretation that other people have been speaking about, I don't need as much evidence. But if I want to say something different, it has to be incredibly clear and decisive. It has to be seven times as clear. And so there's a big burden on my heart. And I question myself to see, was I truly right? I wrestle with myself in this manner. And so last week when I was preaching, even after that week, I continued to wrestle with it. I looked at the word again and again to see whether my interpretation is truly right. And if other scholarly interpretations are wrong. 
And I really had this heavy heart and was wrestling with it. But last uh, Tuesday at 4 a.m., I woke up and I suddenly understood these messages about chapter five on the latter half of chapter five. And so in a manner that is in more detail than what I preached last week. And so because we don't have that much time, I can't explain all that I have uh, realized because this is not the main point of today. Today we're talking about uh, verses 14 to 15. So because of timing wise, I can't explain all the things I realized, but I just want to go over a couple things. First, in verse 17, it says uh, that you reign in life, right? Chapters 5, verse 17. This was what was in contradiction, that this is through this new life, you're living through the word. Uh, and if you look here, it says, who received the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. So what is this grace? If you look at the context in verse 15, it's talking about the grace of Christ and God. And, you know, I don't have time to read all of it for you, so I, we can't see it visually. But in other words, it's that God sent his only begotten son and that Jesus died on the cross. It's talking about that grace. And then this grace in verse 17, what is the result of this? The result of this is explained in verse 15 as two different things, as the gift. That because of this grace, the gift is given to us. It's not talking about the gift of the spirit, but it's talking about the gift of salvation. And so what is then this gift? And that's written out in verses 16 and then 17. So in 16, it says called righteous. And then in verse 17, it says, you are uh, reigning in life. So it's talking about this reign in life as that eternal life. And then if you look in verse 18, it says, so one act of righteousness leads to life for all men. And so this leading to, uh, act of righteousness that's leading to life is talking about this life. It's combining that reign in life to righteousness as well. So what are these two things uh, being combined with and um, being in comparison with? It's this righteousness. It's not talking about living a life uh, by the word and obedience, but rather this righteousness. And in the former half of uh this verse, it talks about death reigning, right? And that that's talking about death. That's in comparison to death. So everyone knows that uh, death reigning is talking about dying. But now that reign in life is in comparison with this uh, reigning in death, it has to be the opposite of that. It has to be earning that life, eternal life. It's not like how commentators have, have uh, described living with this new life, uh, walking that life, right? It, that makes much more sense. And then now we are at verse 19. It says, they are made righteous. And that is in contradiction with my interpretation. So scholars think that this actually means to be made righteous and living out that righteous life. But if you look in verse 17, the main theme is not obedience. It's still to be righteous. And there is no thematic change yet. And you can see that because in uh, the context, in the original language, in Hebrew, uh, the word however is not there yet. It says yet or however in verse 19. It uses that word. So it's showing that it still has not moved on to a new topic. It's talking about the same things. And so if that is the case, if the, there's no thematic change, then this righteousness cannot be about walking a righteous life, but instead needs to constantly still be about this justification and uh, about the sinner. But if we look in verse 21, it says this. Verse 21 says, Great, what you need to see in verse 21 what is in comparison with sin. You think that it'd be righteousness, but it's actually not. What's in comparison is actually grace, sin and grace. Grace also might reign through righteousness. So, what's in comparison is grace and sin. 
if it was righteousness that was com- in comparison with sin, then it would say that righteousness wins against sin. No, sin means living in the sin and righteousness is not living in sin. But instead, it's it's in verse 21, what's in, dif- uh, what's in comparison with grace is this death. And so sin and death is in comparison. And the result of that is death. And righteousness is uh, in comparison with life. And it gives the result is that life. And so death first is in comparison with this uh, righteousness and secondly, as a result, also with eternal life. And so because righteousness is in comparison with death, this righteousness, uh, it cannot be about righteousness, uh, about acting righteously. Because death is in comparison with righteousness. So if you actually look at it, death is, is looked at the same way as this sin, a condemnation. And because of this condemnation, that's why people die. So the opposite of this death is righteousness. And also an opposite of death is this eternal life. And so because this is clearly shown here, this righteousness is talking about righteous, a uh, call to righteousness. It's not talking about uh, acting righteously. So this is clearly shown in this manner. It's it's going to be difficult today. Starting from the beginning, it's hard to understand. No, don't say, uh, I know you might be thinking those thoughts, but it's not difficult. I know there's not enough time to give good examples or give you fun examples. But if you look, listen today, those who are uninterested in the truth, it will be boring. And I can't do anything about that. Even if Jesus was preaching or if Paul was preaching, you wouldn't find it interesting. But if you love the truth and you're interested in the truth, this is not about how smart you are or how dumb you are. If you are interested in the truth, you will understand it. And if you understand it, you will receive grace from it. Right? When you eat something, you have to chew on it to get the taste. So if you understand this, then it becomes food. And you'll be able to understand it. It's not about how smart you are. It's about how interested in it you are. So on whether you are interested in the truth or not. Whether you love the truth or not. And so I know that most of you love the truth. So you'll listen carefully. And that today will be a great grace for you all. And so till last week, I explained up to here. And then I gave the decisive evidence for uh, this interpretation. And I said that it was uh, chapter 6, 1, because it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because if, if in 520 says grace abounded all the more, and verse 21 says grace also might reign through righteousness, then the question in chapter 6, 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? becomes a very weird question and very unnatural. You know, it, it becomes something weird where it's like, are we to keep sinning so that we can have grace? It's a very weird question. And so I showed that this question in it of itself shows um, that not only are we called to righteousness from sin, and so the, with this decisive evidence, I divided uh, Romans 3 to 8 with 3 to 5 and 6 to 8 and talked about this perfect gospel, that this is the true gospel. And we need to believe in this and preach it and spread it further so that in order to make Christian the Christian sphere renewed and restored. And, you know, because I came to terms with this after a very, very difficult process, and it took months for me to understand this truth, I thought that I was done, that all is finished. It is finished. But it wasn't the end. I finished preaching, and I thought I, it was over, but it wasn't the end. If I want to reach perfection, I needed to talk about one more opposition. Because I said that Romans 6.1 was a decisive verse. But a parallel verse to that is verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. 
And in the previous verse, 14, it says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And so I, I, you know, heard these kind of sermons a lot when I was a kid, and I'm sure you all did too. But so many scholars and preachers have been delusioned by a, a, a soteriology that is part of the salvation sect, right? People have been influenced too much by Luther and Calvin. And so they've been delusioned by the salvation sect like soteriology, and so they interpret verse 14 that I just read for you to be that believers are not under the law. And so even if they sin, they won't be condemned or, or uh, perish. That's how they take 14. They say we're, we're under grace, not under law. And so even if we sin, we won't be condemned. Even if we sin, we won't perish. That is how so many pastors have preached on this verse, starting from when I was in Sunday school. And still so many pastors preach in this manner. But this verse does not mean that. Douglas Moo says the following about this verse. Being under the law is being ruled by the old generational system that forcefully, forcefully reinforces sin. And being under grace is belonging to the new generation that can be free from the power of sin. So he says under the law is talking about the old generation. And under grace is being about the new generation. Thomas Schreiner says the following. The phrases huiponomon, under law, and huiponkarin can be understood most well if you see it in the meaning of salvation history. They point to the other generation in God's salvation historical, uh, God's salvational historical plan. Huponomon points to the whole of Moses's generation, while Hupokarin describes a new generation that started through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the logic of verse 14 is as follows. If you are still under the generation of law, sin will have claim over you. But if you are under a generation of grace, then sin cannot have claim over you. And so hyponomon under the law and hypokarin under the grace is talking about different generations. Under the law is talking about Moses' generation. And under grace is talking about this new generation started by Jesus Christ. That's the point. And it's true. It's right that these expressions are about the generation, about the era and the time. So under the law is not actually talking about being under the law, but rather that it's now a new time. To be under the grace. So what is the characteristic of being under the grace? It's not only the forgiveness of the cross, but also winning against sin with grace. And so that's why it says the sin will have no dominion over you. Uh, it's verse 14 that I'm talking about. Why? Because you are not under law, but under grace. And so this traditional interpretation says that we are not under law, but under grace. So even if we sin, we're not condemned, we won't perish. It's not talking about that kind of thing. It's not saying that. Instead, it's saying we are not under the law generation. We are now under grace generation, this new generation. We have the strength through the spirit to win against sin. So sin will have no dominion over you. That is what this is saying. Amen. That's what it means. However, in verse 15, it's a question in regards to verse 14. Because of this, verse 15, which is a parallel verse of verse 4, 1, if this is winning against sin, then you can see verse 1 as being a question winning against obedience. That's why I, I explained to you all that 6-1 is not about obedience, but rather uh, about something else. So that's why this opposition question arises, because verse 15 is about obedience. Uh, if 6.1 is about obedience as well, then that means that 5.20 and 5.21 is about obedience. So this would completely eradicate my interpretation. So I needed to prove whether 6.1 is also about obedience or not. So firstly, I want to explain to you that although I knew about this opposition and this potential contradiction, I didn't want to deal with it because 
Although I did have an answer, it wasn't a perfect answer. I, I wanted to know this as well, an answer to this as well, but it wasn't a perfect answer. And then I also thought this thought, I wonder if anyone will actually make this opposition. You know, I think most people don't even think about the oppositions that I said thus far. But, you know, you might think that it's, um, you know, irresponsible of me. But because this answer doesn't have a clear answer, you know, I could still answer it, although it's not a clear answer. And so is there a reason for me to deal with this? I want to deal with it after I have a decisive answer to it. The last week, God gave me a perfect answer to this question, and it's God's grace. It's not that I researched it incredibly, and that's why I was able to know. And, you know, I had some answers to it, but while talking to our associate pastors while eating, I said, you know, I don't have a perfect answer, but this is what I think. And while saying that, I gave the perfect answer. And this happens to me a lot. You know, I read all of the commentaries and it's not solved. It hasn't been solved for thousands of years. And I'm talking about this problem. And I say, I don't really know this well. I only know up to this much. But while talking about it, I give an answer. That's why I say it's grace. I've experienced this so many times. While saying, I don't know, I suddenly know. I say, I don't know either, you know, even after researching. But after my conversation, I know. And so I record it all. And sometimes it's like 10, 20 recordings. Because I constantly have new revelations. I'll record this and later I have another revelation. So it'll be 10 to 20 re recordings. Sometimes it's even 30 recordings. So beloved, last week, what I have realized, uh, last Tuesday, I want to share with you all this truth. So I wrestled so much with this, with verse 14 to 15. You know, I did everything. I wrestled, I worried, I had a hard time with this. And it was a very long time that it took for me. It's been a couple years that I wrestled with it maybe even uh, many, many years. But if I just look at verse 14, it makes sense. And if I just look at verse 15, it makes sense. But if you combine 14 and 15, that is where issues arise. Because all of a sudden, it seems to be in contradiction with one another, especially because of the question of verse 15. It, it makes it hard to have a right interpretation for verse 14. I already said that the right interpretation for verse 14 is about a generational difference. But if you look at the question in verse 15, it looks like it's in contradiction. That's why you can't help but create a salvation sex soteriology because of verse 15. And the truth is rejected and the false truth is is. Um, is emphasized. And so I was just really confused. And there's a young gentleman here who's nodding his head vigorously. And it really helps me because it's showing that he understands this. And so I wrestled and could not understand why these two verses were in contradiction with one another. So for a very long time, it really ached my mind because no matter how much I meditated on it, I could not find the answer. And I think many of you might have heard this before, a traditional uh, interpretation of verse 14. Traditionally, they have very wrongly misinterpreted this verse. I think almost all of the church, not everyone. But many people have misinterpreted this verse. And it starts with Calvin and Cranfield and even John Stott. Calvin, Cranfield, and John Stott. Many scholars as well have also misinterpreted this to be that we are not under law but under grace. So even if we sin, we will not be judged. That is what it means by sin having no dominion over us. That is how they have misinterpreted this, as I have already explained. Because it's very simple. We see it clearly because what Paul has been dealing with in verse 14 to 15 is not a legalistic uh, mention of justification. Instead, it's saying that we have died to sin. 
right? And so we cannot live by sin, but now need to live by Christ. And so because this is what it's talking about in, in chapter 5, all of a sudden in verse 14, to say we're not under law, but under grace, and because we believe in Jesus, uh, we're now under grace, so we can live however we want, and uh, we're not judged. That's It can't be about that. This is instead has to be about obedience. It's not a legalistic or a legal term for this, uh, for on justification. And like Mu has rebuked this to say that sin had, does not have dominion over you. Mu wrote in his uh, commentary that sin having no dominion over you is based off of uh, chapter uh, six. And what is chapter six talking about? The former half of chapter 6, from verses 1 to 14. Look at it just with your eyes. It talks about the need for obedience. Right? So Mu says it's based on the specific commands of verses 12 to 13 and a summary of this chapter's keynote. So if you look through that, what is 15 to 21 talking about? It's saying that if you do not obey, then you will be forsaken. So up to 14, it's talking about obedience, and 15 to 21, then it's talking about how you will be forsaken if you do not obey. So this is that chapter's keynote. So if you look at the former half even, it doesn't make sense. The Calvin's interpretation and John Stott's interpretation, it doesn't make sense even if you're only looking at the former half of chapter 6. And if you look at the latter half of chapter 6, it makes even less sense. So this cannot be a right interpretation. But there are so many churches right now that are being ruled over by this wrong interpretation. And uh, in the front, we already corrected this, right? I said that we're not under law, but under grace. This is talking about a generational thing. And although we cannot live uh, by the word through the law, but in this generation of grace, we can now through the spirit live by the word. That's how sin do not, no longer has dominion over you. That is how I explained it. And so we clearly know that this is what this means. And so we solved up to verse 14. But now the problem is the next verse, verse 15. Because all of a sudden, in verse 15, it says, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? It all of a sudden asks this. So this is in complete contradiction with the explanation I've just given you. Because in verse 14, what does it say? It says, For sin will have no dominion over you. And so that's why we are not under the law but under grace. And so that's how sin has no dominion over you. But in verse 15, what does it say? It says the opposite. It says, it says, it says, it's giving the reason why you can sin. It says, are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? So it's saying we are able to sin because of this. So it's in complete contradiction with, uh, with one another. How can one author say something so different, so opposite from one another in one verse difference? So what is Paul saying? It, it makes no sense as we see it right now. So for a very long time, I read many commentaries and I wrestled with it and I could not find the answer. But last week, shockingly, and it's a miracle that I was able to solve it. So with great expectation, I hope you listen till the very end. So if this is the case, then what is the meaning of the question in verse 15? We understand verse 14, but why is 15 saying this, this opposite topic? What is the meaning of the question in verse 15? And how can this be in harmony with verse 14 when it looks like it's in contradiction? Because if it's not in harmony, then it's not the Bible, then it's unbiblical and not the truth. So what Paul would be saying would be uh, against the truth. Douglas Moo says the following about this. It is clear that verse 15 is pointing out the latter part of verse 14, because Paul proclaims that saints are not under law, but under grace. Those who unify with Christ in faith live in a new generation with grace reigns and not Moses' law. Because this is so, the behavior of saints aren't limited by the law directly. In the, uh, in the Jewish point of view, this lawlessness would seem to encourage sin. 
and Thomas Schreiner wrote the following. To say that saints are under grace means that the saints have the power to keep the moral regulations of the law. Therefore, proudly saying that they are free from the law does not mean that the saints are free from the law in all of its meaning. Perhaps Paul was answering the people who deduced that those who are free from the law are free even from moral regulations. And so what I have just read, these two different citations have two big hints in understanding verse 15 correctly. But what Mu says is that perhaps this is so. So he's, he's not very sure. He says it like that. So in his words, you can already say, you can see that there's a hint of the truth, but it's not the correct, the complete truth. What Paul is saying and what Mu is saying at the very end is different. The conclusion is different. And what Schreiner answers as Paul saying is different. And it's different from Calvin and Luther and John Stott and Lloyd-Jones. And Pastor uh, Hanum Oak is different. They're all different from Paul. They're not saying the same thing that Paul is saying. Almost all of them. Almost 80 to 90% of pastors, almost 80 to 90% of scholars are not believing in what Paul is saying. And they're actually believing in the opposite of what Paul is saying. And so like these two scholars have uh, explained, I want to uh, show you, and, and I read to you what these scholars have said. So like what these two scholars have said, this Question is not just talking about a legalistic, a legal matter. It's not talking about being under the law, but instead to be free from the law is, does not mean that you are free from moral regulations. And so when Paul is saying, should we sin? That's what, uh, um, you know, Mu and Schreiner is thinking this is saying. So when it's saying, are we to sin? By no means. That's what Mu and Schreiner is thinking this means. But Paul, what he's actually saying goes even further than this. He's saying, because we are not under sin, uh, because we are not under the law, do you think that we will not be um, perished or we will not be condemned? That's what this question is actually asking. So is it saying, so can we sin? It's actually, so this question is something that someone who is on the opposite side of Paul is asking, right? So it's saying, are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? So he's saying, so since we are not under law, but under grace, are we not going to perish because when we sin? We, we're not going to be forsaken, even if we sin, because we're under law, but under grace. So Paul, what you're teaching is saying that we can sin. So that's how uh, Paul's adversaries are attacking Paul. So this is not saying, you know, we're not under law, but under grace, uh, but under grace. So uh, do we, you know, is it okay if we sin? Like, that's not just what it's asking, but it's saying it's asking, it's attacking Paul's uh, assertions because he's saying, he's basically saying this. And so, this is what the real question of verse 15 is saying. And you need to accurately know this to be able to understand the entire cost concept. So I want to prove to you that this is what verse 15 me means. And I want to explain it to you in detail so that you cannot help but uh, agree with me that this is what it means. Before, I used to think that verse 1 and verse 15, the questions in these verses were the same thing. I thought verse 1 was uh, focusing on uh, the grace and faith that is emphasized uh, against legalism. It's uh, a question highlighting chapters 3 to 5, that it's not through the uh, acts of the law, but through God's grace and faith that we are called to righteousness. And it's, uh, but I also explained to you that both are about justification. So this is right. It is about uh, justification. So I thought that verse one was like this. I thought that it was not, uh, I explained to you last week as well. Verse one is not understanding the entire gospel, but it's, asking a question, only knowing half of the gospel. 
So I thought verse 15 was the same. However, it's a different question. Verse 15, although it's similar to verse 1, is not the exact same question. Although it's similar to verse 1, it's not the same question. Because verse 1 and verse 15 are based on different things. If they were based on sim the same things, we get the same question. But they're based upon different things. So you might think this thought. You might think, what are both of these questions based upon? It's a very simple question. What are these questions each based upon? And it's exactly what they have talked about till then. So verse 1 is talking about everything before 6-1. And verse 15 is talking about everything before uh, verse 15. And so thus, chapter 6-1 is based on everything up to the end of chapter 5. And chapter 6-15, that question is based on everything up till chapter 6-14. And this is what the Spirit told me. Oh, Pastor, is this not, isn't this just your guess? No, it's not a guess. Think about it. Paul's adversaries, do you think they only asked a couple questions? You think it's just one or two? There must have been countless ones. But why does Paul only ask um, the question in verse 15 after explaining up to 614? And why did he ask the question in verse 1 after ex only after explaining everything in chapter 5? And the reason is this. Paul, when he explains the gospel, gives the opposition, it's showing that after Paul explained up till that point, that opposition question came just then. So these are questions coming from people who are asking after they listen to the gospel up till that point. So more accurately, to put it more clearly, those questions were put exactly in a specific spot by Apostle Paul. So these two questions are based upon what was spoken before these questions are asked. So to go a little bit further, the question in chapter 6-1 is talking about how grace abounds, right? Grace also might reign through righteousness, and this is all about justification. And so through God's grace, we are called righteous. That's what this is based on, and this question is based on this. However, verse 15 goes a little further. And it's not only about God's grace and faith that we are called to righteousness, but also that we have died to sin, because this is in 6.2, right? That we should not sin instead, we should not sin, but instead need to live by God's word. After explaining up till here, then this question is asked. So it's different. It's not just up to chapter 5, like verse 1. But it's also including... The answer to uh, verse 1, which is in verses 2 to 14. And so verse 15 starts with, um, because it starts, what then? So it's starting with what then? So this grammar is showing that it's based upon the for former verses. It's based upon 14 and, uh, and before. So truly, chapter 3 to 5, It's not only about chapters 3 to 5, but it's also about things uh, that have to do with obedience. And that's what this question is on. It's about all of that. And so I don't even need to cite the, um, the scholars during this because, you know, I, I organized what I received as revelations. And so if you just listen, you'll be able to understand all of this. And so the question in verse 1 was only based on everything up till chapter 5. And verse 15 adds verses 2 to 14, all of that as well, which talk about the importance of obedience. So it's based on all of that as well. And this is what I'm sp saying to you today. But th there's something here that's incredibly important. It's that chapter 6, right, chapter 6, 2 to 14, if you look there, it says... It doesn't say that if you do not obey, that you will perish. It doesn't say that yet. If you do not obey, you will perish. It doesn't say this specifically. Instead, it says that you should not sin, that you should live by the word. 
That's what it's talking about here. However, based on that is the question in verse 15. In other words, that is why the question 15 is, is said. And so here it says, it says, you know, not only did it say we can't sin, but you need to live by the word. But why can we not sin? Because if we sin, then you will perish and be condemned. If that is the case, then the question in verse 15 would not even come out. Because then you have to live by the word, right? There's no doubt about it. And, you know, although we're not under the law, but we're under grace, shall we sin? That kind of question can't come out if all of that was explained. That's why verse 15 comes out, because that wasn't explained yet. It says, don't sin and, and, don't, and you need to obey. But it doesn't talk about what the result of that is yet. So that's why that question comes out. Since we're not under law, but under grace, shall we sin? I know we shouldn't sin, but doesn't that mean that we're not judged when we won't perish? So aren't you saying that we should, we're able to sin? That's what this question is asking. That's why the question of 15 comes out. And so the question of verse 15 is basically like the following. Let's say you can live by the word through the spirit. Through the spirit's help. Let's say through the spirit's help, you can live by the word. Since you say in chapter six, four means that you are living out your faith with this new life. Let's say you can live according to the word with the new life that the spirit gives you. However, since you are not under law, but under grace, you wouldn't be judged even if you sin, right? Therefore, isn't this asserting that you can live in sin? That's what this is saying. That's what verse 15 is saying. And so for a very long time, we misinterpreted and had wrong thoughts about this question. We thought that this was not the question from adversaries, but rather from us. But this is not a question that we are asking. This is a question that Paul's adversaries are asking. But we looked at it from our perspective and we thought, oh, but this kind of question is impossible because we think this right away. We say, oh, but yeah, we're not under law, but we are under the law of Christ, right? Yeah, we're not under the law, but we're under Christ's law. So why is this question even asked? Isn't this question impossible? Why is this question asked? And so we get confused about what this message is on. And that's why the interpretation of this verse is completely convoluted. But listen carefully. Paul received the gospel and the truth by revelation and wrote the Pauline epistles. And so he knows the complete gospel. And we learn, reread that, this Bible and research it. So we have the same interpretation as Paul. So for us, this question does not arise. This makes sense, right? This question will not arise for us. However, Paul's adversaries is are, are different from Paul and us. If his interpretation was similar to his adversaries. They wouldn't ask this question. They would all agree and there would be no opposition. But the fact that they're asking these questions show that their thoughts are different from Paul's. So this question is different from our thoughts. Although it's impossible for us, for the adversaries, this was not an impossible question. For us, it's an impossible question. But for the adversaries, it's something that is completely possible. Think about the question in verse one. If you know the complete gospel that we know, then that question cannot come out. But because they only knew a part of the gospel, that's why they're asking this question. So in the same way, in verse 15, they only know what is written in verse 14 about the uh, being under the law and uh, not under the law, but under grace. If they knew that expression as well as we did, then th that question would not come out. Because in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 21, it says that we are not under the law, but we are under Christ's law. Although we're not under the law of Moses, we are under the law of Christ. And it says that clearly in this chapter, in, in this verse, we know this and Paul knows this. That's why this question will not come out. And we can't ask this question, right? Because we know that we're not under the law, but under grace. How can that be possible? How can you say that? Because we're under Christ's law. Of course we can't sin. That's what we would say. 
Corinthians, but one person might say this, that's just written in first Corinthians. Right now we're talking about Romans and this isn't written in Romans. And they might ask this question. However, that is not the case. In Romans 3 31, Paul already wrote the following. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. He says, we don't overthrow the law, but we uphold the law. If we overthrew the law, then we don't have to keep it, but we uphold the law. And what is that law? That's not Moses' law. It's similar to that law, but it's the law of Christ that was fulfilled, that fulfilled Moses' law. And it also says this in Romans 8, 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And after this as well, there are more verses like this, but this is enough, so I won't speak at all. And so to have the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we have to keep it. This is not legalistic. Paul is not legalistic. So he's taught, he's not saying that you have to keep, keep, um, you know, you have to be circumcised. You have to keep all of these different laws. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying what Jesus is speaking in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And we learned it in the Sermon on the Mount. We learned through the 21 verses 21 to 48. We learned all of what the commandments mean. And he fulfilled the law. He made perfect the law. So we are under this law of Christ. We are not under the law of Moses. So, you know, we can eat uh, meat, we can eat pigs, we can eat whatever we want, right? We don't have anything like that that keeps us. We are under the law of Christ. We're not judged by Moses' law, but because we're under the law of Christ, we are judged by Christ's law. That's why James says this liberty, law of liberty, you will be judged by the law of liberty. And so act and speak according to this law of liberty because we will be judged by that. And so those who do not live by this law of Christ are the ones who have this righteousness like the scribes and Pharisees. And so to live by the Christ law is to have better righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees. And that's why Jesus says, if you do not have righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So because he says this, those who do not do so will be judged and will go to hell. And so what Paul is saying here, you know, that you have to uphold the law is not talking about the law of Moses, but it's talking about that law that Jesus fulfilled in the Sermon on the Mount. That is what he is talking about. And Paul knew this. And just like he spoke, just like Jesus spoke, when we keep it, and when if we don't have better righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees, we cannot help but be thrown to hell. And Paul knew this truth. So for Paul, this kind of question will not come out. And we, because we know this, we can't ask this question, but the adversaries don't know this, right? So the question in verse 15, all they know is that it says to obey. That's why the question of verse 15 occurs. And so there's one thing that we need to think about here. If this is the truth, then how, like, how can this question be a, a, a limestone, be a testing stone um, in the Bible for the for the gospel? Right, the adversary is only understood to this extent. So, like Lo Jones says, this cannot be a touchstone. This can't be a testing stone for the gospel. So, if this is all you know. It's biblical to say, if this is all you know, if you only know a part of the gospel, then this question comes out. But Lloyd-Jones says that if you know the true gospel, then this question will come out. And that if this question does not come out, then you are not preaching the true gospel of Paul. That's what Lloyd-Jones says. And it has fooled so many pastors. You can see how wrong this standard is. To go even further. We're getting to the highlight, right? There's one more important thing than this. You might have forgotten, but in verse 15, that question, what is it about? The question of verse 15 is something like this. They say this, that we need to live by the word. We are under grace. 
Thus they are not only made righteous, but have received new life and can live by the word and must live by the word. However, we are not under the law, but under grace. Therefore, although we should live that life, even if we can't, we will not be forsaken or perish. Thus, in conclusion, doesn't this assertion mean that it is okay to sin? That's what this question is asking. That's what these adversaries are asking. That's the meaning behind verse 15. But what's spectacular is that these are the questions that uh, the adversaries are ridiculing, right? They don't believe in this. This is their ridicule. But this ridicule, isn't it? doesn't it seem very familiar? Doesn't it seem like something you've heard? Right? This is what the Orthodox churches are asserting. Almost all pastors, almost 80 past 80% 80 of pastors, I would say, this is the gospel, the this ridicule that the adversaries were giving. This is the the sermon that is being preached. And this is what they are still preaching. We are not under the law, but we are called to faith and call to righteousness through God's grace. However, this does not mean that we can live however we want. We need to live through this grace. But because we are not under the law, we are under grace. So if, even if we cannot live by the law, we won't be forsaken or perish. We're safe. Therefore, one saved is always saved. Isn't this what they say? This is what uh, the love church says or Myungsung Church says, or Yongnak Church says, or Suyong um, Church says. This is what almost all churches are preaching. This is what world-renowned Christian um, pastors are preaching. This is what they're saying. What are they saying? It's this. But what we can't be shocked about, maybe we can't help but be shocked of, is that this is what Paul was strongly rejecting, that this was not the truth. He says, by no means. This is what he says. Apostle Paul says very clearly, and to go even further, not only Paul, but this is what the adversaries were ridiculing. He, They didn't believe in this. They were saying, does this make sense? This is what you're saying. That makes no sense. Is that what you're saying? Is this, is this the assertion you're making? That is what Christian, uh, the Protestant church is teaching right now. It's what Paul refuted and what his adversaries ridiculed as nonsense. That teaching is what the Protestant church is teaching as the truth right now. Except for a, a, a few minority, this is what they're teaching. And almost all churches say that this is an orthodox truth. that the, And they're fooled by doctrine. And they say that they're orthodox. And, and you know, this is not biblical. We need to repent. We need to take Jesus as our Lord. We need to be born again. We need to obey. And if you do not obey, then you will be forsaken. When I say this, they say I'm a heretic. Who is the real heretic? Who is the real orthodox? Love church is not uh, uh, her heretical. You know, these churches are not heretical, but they're not orthodox either. Beloved, who is truly biblical? Who is truly orthodox? It's beloved church. It's a church that God has uh, built for this generation to, to take away the darkness in the Protestant church and to restore the truth here. I'm not a smart person. I'm not someone to boast of. But why am I able to understand things that these world-renowned scholars cannot understand? You know, I, I said that I didn't know, and then all of a sudden I know. This is something that God is doing with purpose. This is not something I can boast about. That's why I keep saying that it's God's grace. And that's why I continue to say that I give God all the glory. Because this is something that God uh, can't stay looking at. 
they need to be changed. They need to be restored. They need to return to the truth. And so that's why God is using our church and working in this manner. And so that's why I always say that there needs to be a religious reformation. How can they think that this is orthodox, what Paul has refuted and what his adversaries even ridicule? How can they think that this is the truth? How can so many pastors and so many scholars think that that's the truth? And, and, and teach these the believers who don't know better that this is the truth. And, and they're leading them to the wide path of death instead of the narrow path of life so that so many people will go to hell instead. Not in the world, but in the church. And so that's why God is doing these things. Uh, someone might ask me this question. You know, this is the first time I'm hearing that verse 15 means this. Is it that not just your assertion? There's no evidence that verse 15 means the following. However, that is not the case. This is not just a guess. Now, there is decisive evidence that shows that, that this is what this verse uh, means. History repeats itself. It's the same then and now. The adversaries don't know what we know and what Paul knows. These adversaries don't know the truth. There are many adversaries to the truth. There are pastors, denominations, and scholars, and heresy hunters who are adversaries to the truth. They don't know this truth that we know and that Paul knows. They don't know this entire gospel. All they know is faith alone and that you are saved through faith. That's all they know. And so that's why they ask the question of verse 15. And that's why today's adversaries, like uh, like how John Stott distorted verse 15 are preaching these kind of sermons. So I explained to you what the question of 15 means, but what is the answer to Paul's question? This is where the answer is. What does it say? The answer to this question is the following. Paul strongly refutes this saying by no means he's refuting calvinism he's refuting presbyterianism he says by no means and then afterwards in verse 16 he says the following do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness this is incredibly important. Paul is saying this. He's saying, no, if you do not obey, you will be forsaken. You will perish. And not, you know, before in 2 to 14, he says, uh, you know, do not sin. You have to obey. But he didn't talk about what happens when you do not sin. But after this question, he answers, right? It's saying, if you don't obey, what will happen, right? Will I really be forsaken? Right? Because if I'm not forsaken, then I can sin, right? To that question, Paul is saying, no, if you do not obey, you will be forsaken. If you do not obey, you will perish and you will perish as slaves of sin. And it's not only here, but also up till verse 23, all of it is talking about this, that if you do not obey, that you will perish, that you will be forsaken. Read it with your uh, own eyes. That's what all of it talks about. It continues to talk about that until verse 23. It's clear. So how can you say one saved is always saved? If you read Romans while reading these words, how can you think like how Calvin thought? How can you think like how Presbyterian pastors think? How can you say one saved is always saved? You see now how unbiblical Calvin's teachings are. And I hope you understand it. But through this, you can see that the very question itself, you can see that this is what th that question means. Because all of 16 to 23 is an answer to that very question in that manner. You know, no one 
denies that you don't have to, uh, that you should, uh, sin. Like no one denies that it's bad, uh, to sin. Everyone understands that you should not sin. And so the question of verse 15 is asking whether you can sin since you are not under law, but under grace. But since that is the question, that's why the answer is no, you cannot live like that. You need to obey because if you do not obey, then you will be forsaken. Then you will be uh, fallen. Then you will perish. Then you will go to hell. That's what proves this answer proves what verse 15 is asking. So Paul's question in verse 15 shows us exactly what it means uh, by looking at the answer in 16 to 23. So verses 16 to 23, that's why it talks about this because the question asks what it does. So let's continue on. In verses 17 to 18, he also says this, but thanks be to God that you were, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. So what is this about? This is the answer, right? It's, it's continually answering that question. So basically saying this, those who are saved are people like this. This is salvation. However, if you continue to live in sin, then what meaning is there to your salvation? Then isn't salvation in vain? That's what it's saying. People who are saved are set apart from sin. And they are now slaves of righteousness. But if you continue to sin, then why did you receive salvation? How is that salvation? What is there? What meaning is there behind salvation? So can you live like that? No. Say so you can't. And then Paul continues saying this, Romans 6, 19. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. It's very simple. It's saying, do not live sinning. You need to live holy, a holy life. But why do we need to live like this? Why can't we live like the world? Why can't we live like other church members? Why can't we live like these corrupt political pastors? Why can't we live like other elders or deaconesses? Why can't we live like that? Why do we have to live a holy life? Why do we have to obey? Why do we have to live by God's word? Why do we have to repent? Why do we have to fight against sin? Why do we have to wrestle? The answer is in verses 20 to 21. Let's look first at verses 20 to 21. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. What this means is that when you were slaves of sin, didn't you live that life? You know, you lived in sin. But now, if you're slaves of sin again, you're going back to that past. And just as you lived back then, you are living towards death. And now let's look at verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So what this is saying, oppositely, when you are now slaves of God and those who live righteously and holy life will receive eternal life. Only those people will receive eternal life. And then as a conclusion, Paul says this. He says this, repeat after me, for the wages of sin is death. This is Paul's final claim here. For the wages of sin is death. And people don't know this verse. There's so many people who don't know that this verse exists. What Do you know what this means? When we look all the way through the context, we've been looking through it all, we can see what this means. Because according to the context, this means two different things. First, as it has already been inferenced, Before you believed in Jesus, you lived as slaves of sin. And what is the result of sin? It's death. It's perishing. It's hell. That's that first meaning. The second meaning is right before that. After you believe in God, if you do not obey, if you continue to sin, then the result of that sin is death. It's perishing. It's hell. That's what this means. For the wages of sin 
is death. It's not just for evangelizing. Paul is not evangelizing here. Paul is speaking to believers. He's not just speaking to non-believers. It's not just the wages of sin is death for non-believers. Wages of sin is death for believers as well. That's why in James 1.15, it's the same thing. It says, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Both are speaking to believers. Not only non-believers, but believers as well. If you continue to sin and have habitual sin and that sin grows and you do not turn away from that sin, then that sin will lead to death. So believers as well, if they continue to sin, then just like non-believers are perish because of their sin, they will also perish. It's a scary warning. But Paul says that God's gift, because of God's gift, but that God's gift is salvation. Because of this, People compare it. The wages of sin is death, but God's gift is life. So they think that this salvation will give life. It seems a little unnatural. And so people might be interested in this. But if you look carefully here, you can see what it means. Because in verse 23, sin and God are in comparison with each other. So it's the wages of sin and God's gift are in comparison with each other, right? Salvation is God's gift. So these two things are uh, in comparison. So what does that mean? It means that sin leads to death and God leads to eternal life. That's what it means. God, sin gives us death. It doesn't just give us enjoyment. It gives us death. God, although he seems like he's oppressing you, gives you life. Amen? God gives you life. However, verse 20 to 21 says, Paul says, that what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And then in verse 22 it says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. And after that, he says in verse 23, the wages of sin is death. So what does this mean? It means that when you sin, because the wages of sin is death, you will die. But if you obey God, then God's gift is life. So you will earn eternal life. That's what this means. You need to look at the Bible through its context. So here, the absolute need for obedience and then all of a sudden it says the wages of sin is death and God's gift is life so that uh, the non-believers go to hell and believers go to heaven. There's no way that that would be the meaning, right? If you look at the context, it's what I just explained. So I want to conclude the message today. As I have explained in detail, verse 15, the answer to verse 15 is in 16 to 23. And that answer is like the following. You know, in this generation of grace, we can live according to the word through the help of the spirit. However, under because we are not under the law, to say that we are safe is completely dangerous and wrongful thought. Because if we do not live by the word, then you, we will be forsaken and perish. That is what verses 16 to 23 are saying. And this is the answer of Paul to the question in verse 15. But, you know, there's this saying that, woe is me, and then I don't know the rest of that phrase. Unfortunately, this, question, this teaching that Paul has rejected has completely captivated the Christian sphere. And that is, is Luther's teaching that emphasizes faith alone and Calvin's teaching that emphasizes one saved, always saved. And they both say that although the believers do not live by the word, that they can go to heaven because one's saved and we're saved through grace and one saved is always saved. We're safe. To those who do not believe, 
You need to say that you need to repent and you need to tell them to receive Jesus as their Lord. To those who do not believe they need, you need to tell them to be born again. And to believers, you need to say to love Jesus, to love neighbors, to hate sin and to live obeying God. That you can be forsaken. So you need to discipline your body to live according to God's will. But instead, when they sing, you know, when you sing, you can lip sync, right? You don't have to actually sing, but you can just open your mouth. That's what Luther did. That's what Calvin is doing. And that's what Presbyterian pastors are doing. They say we're saved through grace and we need to live by the word. They lip sync it. They say, of course you need to live by the word. And they say that just like a lip sync. And it's not the right uh, word because they say something else afterwards. They say we're not under the law, but under grace. So even if you cannot live by the word, we will not be judged. They say that. We will not be forsaken and we'll go to heaven. That's why pastors are so corrupt. They don't have a conscience. They don't have brave uh, courage. They're not really thinking about God's kingdom. These pastors are so corrupt and rotten. And these elders are corrupt and rotten. And the elder, when an elder became a president, uh, did they, what changed? Nothing changed. When the elders become, um, uh, you know, senators, what changes? What did they do? They're corrupt and rotten. Deaconesses are corrupt and rotten. You know, people are so self-centered and they're so selfish. They say, oh, of course you should live by the word. Well, no, only a minority do that. Many people say, oh, oh. I don't have to live by the word and I can still go to heaven, then I don't need to worry about that. I just need to earn a lot of money and enjoy life. There's nothing different from a non-believer. These pastors are no different from non-believers. Almost everyone is like that. They're no different from non-believers, these pastors. There are so many like that. They have nothing that is different from the, uh, non-believers. These elders and believers that are no different from non-believers. They're not the light of the world. They're not the salt of the earth. They're not the fragrance of Jesus. And they dirty the name of Christ. They dirty the name of Christianity. That's the Korean churches right now. Isn't that the image of the Korean churches right now? Yes, there are some amazing you know, people, but the majority are like this. Is it just the leftist party that's like that? No, it's because the Christian church has become corrupt that the people have turned away from us. It's not just the leftists that have turned away from us. It's like the church is full of greed. It's like the elders and the scribes and Pharisees who were corrupt and rotten and because of jealousy, they uh, went against Jesus. And, you know, King Herod saw all of that. And Pilate saw through all of that. And they, you know, they must have detested the scribes and the high priests. He must have detested them inside. He must have looked at those elders and detested them. Our, our country's like this, you know these political pastors who are even elected as candidates, even them, they, I can't even call them pastors. There are only words. They're cowardly. They won't come out. You know, we saw all of that during our heresy claims. Nobody stuck out for us. Nobody stood up for us. You know, nobody uh, like did, you know, didn't worry about the cost that would have to be paid to stand with us. Nobody did that. Beloved, you are saved through truth and made holy through the truth and called righteous through the truth. And the opposite is the same as well. Mistruth makes you cowardly. False truth makes you selfish and calculative. It makes you greedy. This false truth has created Christianity to deteriorate and become a cave of swindlers and thieves. And this false truth has made 
true sheep goats. And so through this word today, we really want you all to discern that Calvin and Luther's teachings are wrong. It's not heretical, but it's wrong. It's not true orthodox that these teachings are wrong. But the church says that these teachings have taken over 80% of the church. 80% of the church is walking this wide path. How much will God's heart ache? So we must believe in this and not only have a good faith life, but we need to spread this, whether people listen or not. You know, when the Roman sermon series comes out as a book, when you read it, you can tell what the truth is and what the false truth is. And we need to preach this. And I pray that you all will do this. And I bless you in Jesus' name. As we pray today, let us remember what we heard today so that we can live out this word. And Father God, may you have pity on the Korean churches. You know, how can we stay? How long can we stay like this? Lord, we have pity on the American churches, on the European churches, on the churches in Africa. Will you have pity on them? Will you have pity on Christianity? You know, how long will you allow us to stay in darkness? How long will you allow us to be disillusioned by these falsehoods? Will you shine your light? Will you allow us to realize the truth? Will you allow us to discern and give us open hearts to take in this truth so that everyone will repent? That pastors and elders and deacons will repent and that everyone will repent and truly return to you. Let us intercede and pray today. Let us pray all together.
하나님의 말씀 앞에 진리의 말씀 앞에 바르게 반응하며 깨닫는 마음을 주시고 하나님 앞에 돌이키며 회개할 수 있는 마음 부어주시옵소서 진리를 사랑할 수 있는 마음을 한국교회 부어주시옵소서 참된 진리를 깨닫고 분별할 수 있는 마음 죄로부터 완전히 돌이킬 수 있는 마음을 한국의 성도들 가운데 보시고 우리 가운데 부어주시옵소서 아마 아버지 평안하다 평안하다 하며 구원의 확신만을 심어주었던 한국교회 왜곡된 이 진리 앞에 왜곡된 비 진리 앞에서 수많은 영혼들이 지옥을 향하여 강과 같이 흘러가고 있음에도 불구하고 아버지 깨어나지 못하고 있는 계신 교회에 안타까운 현실을 주님 불쌍히 여겨 주시옵소서 한국교회를 깨워 주시옵소서 개신교회 새로운 변화의 바람이 불어오게 하소서 하나님의 진리 앞에 납작 엎드릴 수 있는 가난한 마음 부어 주시옵소서 하나님 사랑하는 교회 이 놀라운 하나님의 손을 두신 아버지 이 진리의 말씀이 뻗어나갈 수 있도록 하나님이 이 진리의 말씀을 듣는 사람들마다 하나님 앞에 돌이키며 참된 신자의 길로 들어갈 수 있도록 의의 종 순종의 종으로 살아갈 수 있도록 아버지 은혜를 모시고 부어주시옵소서 아버지 아버지 사랑하는 교회 하나님이 함께 하시고 아버지 영광으로 임하시며 하늘의 문을 여시고 진리의 영으로 성경회로 아버지 함께 하시는 주님을 찬양하며 경배합니다 사랑하는 교회 통하여 아버지 하나님 하시는 그 은혜 아버지께서 진리의 그 문을 활짝 열으시는 그 목적을 통하여 아버지 죽어가는 영혼들을 살리시옵소서 한국에 계신 교들을 살리시고 회복하시옵소서 아프리카와 열방과 유럽에 아버지 주님의 몸된 교회들을 살리시고 회복하시옵소서 생명을 주시되 봉성해 주시는 아버지 나는 교회들이 깨어나기를 원한다 나는 교회들이 깨어나기를 원한다 나는 목회자들이 깨어나기를 원한다 이 진리가 아닌 진리로 복음으로 성경이 말하는 그 말씀의 진리대로 살아나 아버지 죽어가는 영혼들을 살리시고 아버지 회복하시고 구원하기를 원하시는 내 아버지의 그 소원을 이루시옵소서 사랑하는 교회를 통하여 충격이하게 일어나게 하시고 세계 열방의 교회들이 깨어날 수 있도록 아버지의 소원과 꿈을 이루어 드릴 수 있도록 주의 성령님 역사여 주시옵소서 하나님 우리가 이 말씀의 은혜를 학교에 받지 않게 하여 주시옵소서 하나님이 분명하고 뚜렷하게 이 진리를 우리 가운데 심으실 때 하나님 우리가 겸손하고 깨어있게 하여 주시옵소서 우리의 마음이 진리에 굳건하게 세워지게 하여 주시옵소서 죄악을 하나님 소원하게 여기는 그 모든 마음이 우리에게서 제거되게 하여 주시옵소서 죄의 삭슨 사망이라 죄의 삭슨 사망이라 분명하게 말씀하시는 주의 음성에 그 말씀과 진리에 하나님 우리의 마음과 생각을 고정시키게 하여 주시옵소서 우리를 준비시키시는 나의 아버지 영혼의 구원을 위한 아버지의 마음으로 준비시키시고 하늘 진리로 준비시키시는 나의 아버지 하나님 우리를 준비되게 하시는 것 감사합니다 전하게 하시옵소서 하나님이 말씀과 진리로 영혼들에게 전하게 하시옵소서 신자와 불신자에게 전하게 하여 주시옵소서 하나님 그리하여 하나님 중보하는 우리의 중보가 하나님 진실로 실제로 영원 구원으로 교회의 회복으로 일어나질 수 있도록 주님 역사하여 주옵소서 이 말씀을 듣는 모든 목회자에게 깨닫는 은혜를 부어주시옵소서 교회 교회마다 회복되는 은혜를 진리 회복의 은혜를 부어주시옵소서 열방의 영혼의 구원을 위한 내 아버지의 마음 
영광의 역사가 그대로 성취될 수 있도록 주님 은혜를 베풀어 주시옵소서 At this time, we want to proclaim healing. With the spirit of healing, Lord, will you fill us? And with your strength and life, will you create us anew and heal our spirit and body? At this time, in Jesus' name, may all the spirits of illness be gone in Jesus' name. May all weaknesses and pain and and symptoms be gone in Jesus name may all symptoms of cancer be gone in Jesus name may all cancer cells be rebuked all illnesses and pain because of cancer and all the after effects of cancer be gone in Jesus name may all the pain in our bodies right now be rebuked and gone in Jesus name may all lumps be rebuked and be gone in Jesus name May all our organs that have lumps and tumors and cysts be gone in Jesus name. And all cancer cells in the uh, in the uterus be gone in Jesus name. May uterine cancer and uterine myoma be uh, rebuked in Jesus name. And may stomach cancer and liver cancer and all different types of incurable diseases be gone and healed in Jesus name and we proclaim healing for encephalopathy right now in Jesus name may all types of encephalopathy be healed in Jesus name may all blocked blood vessels uh, be opened again May all different types of blood circulation be uh, renewed and returned to normal and all types of cranial nerve and cerebral nerve damage be healed in Jesus name. May all after effects of all different types of uh, cancer treatments be gone in Jesus name. May all pain disappear. And especially for rectal cancer, we proclaim against rectal cancer. May all pain and suffering that people have experienced because of rectal cancer be healed in Jesus' name. May all the cancer cells of rectal cancer disappear. May all the levels of the cancer cells disappear and return to normal in Jesus' name. May all different types of tumors and brain tumors, every problem because of this, be healed in Jesus' name. And all side effects of the vaccine, may it be gone. May all side effects because of COVID-19 be gone in Jesus' name. All pains of the heart will disappear. All heart pain and chest pain be gone in Jesus' name. And angina be gone in Jesus' name. And may heart ar arrhythmia and irregular pulse uh, be gone in Jesus' name. May it return to normal and be healed. All different types of sufferings and pain because of different illnesses be gone in Jesus' name. Lord, will you pour out your life? Lord, will you reign with new life? May all spiritual oppressions be gone in Jesus' name. May depression and bipolar disorder disappear right now in Jesus' name. May panic disorder disappear. May schizophrenia disappear. May osteosarcoma disappear and from different types of cancer starting from collectoral cancer colon cancer breast cancer may they all be healed in jesus name ovarian cancer cervical cancer may people be healed in jesus name may all cancer cells disappear right now lord may people be freed from liver cirrhosis Lord, may people be healed from these pains. And Lord, may knee cartilages be restored and created. And may your life be poured out inside people's joints. Lord, we pour out the spirit of healing inside people's organs. May these organs be restored to normal. And Lord, all liver pain, all liver inflammation may it be gone in jesus name may hepatitis b be healed in jesus name lord you are healing the stomach wall right now lord may the stomach wall be cleaned and cleansed and may stomach ulcers disappear and lord may this uh, different types of indigestion 
indigestion disappear, and gastroptosis、um, disappear, and gastroparesis disappear. And Father, will you heal epilepsy? Lord, we rebuke epilepsy, and Lord, will you heal it in Jesus' name? May all types of epileptic seizures stop right now, and may all brain cells return to normal. May the brain be structured back to its normal restoration. Lord, we proclaim healing in the brain cells right now. Lord, may the brain vessels and all issues of the brain be healed right now in Jesus' name. May all issues that happen through the brain, may all paralysis, may they all disappear. And be healed in Jesus' name. We pray all this in Jesus' name, Amen. And now our senior pastor will come up and pray for the offering and end with the benediction. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, and when we think of your love and grace, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for leading us to this truth, and we praise you and worship you for this, and give you all the glory. Father, we have given you all these offerings and thanks. Lord, Sunday offerings, thanks offerings, different types of offerings, we have lifted up to you. Lord, will you receive it and receive all the grace? And Lord, will you be there in spirit where these offerings are used, so that so many souls can be saved? Father God, upon all members who have given these offerings. Lord, who are working for Your kingdom and for the souls, Lord, will You give them the ability to have blessings in both hands, so that everything that they do may be blessed, so that they can prosper. Lord, that good things will happen in their life, that the blessing that You have poured out to Abraham will be poured out to them. May they become the root of all blessings and take on that responsibility. Lord, will You pour out the Spirit upon all of us? Lord, will you let us be filled with the Spirit? Lord, will you let us be filled with the Spirit? And starting from our Sunday schoolers and especially to our young adults, Lord, will you remember them? And Lord, will you give good partners to our young adults,、uh, young adults, so that they can meet these good partners? Father, will you work amongst us? Will you work diligently and meticulously amongst us, so that these young adults can also receive good jobs? Father, will you、uh, give us these blessings? Lord, will you heal all those people who are sick? Will you heal them from head to toe? Will you touch them and heal them? In Jesus' name, they will be healed. In Jesus' name, they will be healed from head to toe. They will be healed. All illnesses will be gone, and they will be made stronger. In Jesus' name, all oppressions of the evil spirits will be gone. In Jesus' name. And they will be made free in Jesus' name. They will be freed. Lord, will you come to all of us and be with all of us, so that we can live a life walking with you? We pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with the hearts of all the people who have worshipped on this Sunday. And、with their families and children and businesses, with the church, the city, this country, and North Korea, Israel, Ukraine, Africa, and all the nations, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>